We're, we're in 2 Timothy again this morning, chapter 2. We're going to do a few verses there in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Paul is talking about Timothy and, and his faith this morning. And so many of Paul's letters, if you, if you remember those letters, they, they have a shepherding and a caring tone to them. It's like they just, his heart goes out to them, but, but it's more of a shepherding. I want you to do this, do that. Now, Timothy's letter is a little more personal because he had great love and concern for the one he called my son in faith. Now, and he wanted to be sure that Timothy succeeded as a pastor and a teacher. Paul is in prison. We know that, uh, that where he's at, he's suffering in prison. He's near the end of his life. He thought it was important to encourage Timothy. You remember what we learned last week that Timothy was a little sickly. He was a little emotional. He cried a lot. And then he was, uh, he was timid. We know that. I'm telling you, I think about that crying a lot when, uh, when, he, when Paul was leaving, he was crying. My oldest daughter, when she was two or three years old, every time we'd leave Grandma and Grandpa's house, she would cry halfway between Lubbock and, and Deer Park. And I, I, I would just almost have to get on to her. Now, you've got you to gotta hush crying now. I mean, it, but she was so sad. But it, it made me think about Timothy as, as a young man, uh, how he cried. And uh, it, would, it would not seem manly today, would it? Uh, chapter 2 that we're in today. You know, see, suffering was increasing all over the world. Uh, Nero, we, we studied him. We know he, he was not a good guy. He was notorious for being hostile to Christians. And, and we see that, uh, you know, that uh, Paul knew standing for the gospel, you were going to suffer persecution. Not much different than today. You know, now Christ followers, though, in the United States, we understand we, we do not regularly face persecution, do we? Can you, you I, I don't know of a time, you know, oh yeah, you'll, you'll have the typical stuff, but it's not the persecution that Paul and Timothy were, were looking at. Right. It was so different, and, and, but it's a terrible reality, guys, across the globe. Now, now just listen to this. Uh, the, the Christians suffer violence, the hostility and mistreatment all over the world today. You, you can look this up. There's too many statistics to name, but I'm just going to show you a few. Every month, every month, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. Every month, 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed. Every month, 770 some odd acts of violence, beatings, abductions, rapes, wrongful arrest, forced marriages are committed against Christians. Now, Number one on that list is North Korea. You could expect that. Number two, Afghanistan. It's very dangerous to be a Christian in those countries. And 360 million people worldwide suffer persecution. At the one in seven people, one in seven people suffer some kind of serious persecution. On that list also, Nigeria, India, and you remember the, the group called Boko Haram? I, I don't know who that bunch is, but I, I know that they're notorious. They, they take captive and, and abduct entire schools of young children and put them into forced labor, prostitution with a girl or whatever it is. I, it's uh, unbelievable, but that kind of stuff is going on all across the United States, and, and that's happening in Africa right there. So we know that, that Paul is there. He knows it's coming. Now, now, chances are your children, your grandchildren in this case, will not experience that reality in their lives. But rather than being ashamed of the lack of suffering, guys, we ought to fall on our knees and thank God for the freedom and security we have in this United States. Now, it's not as good as it you would like for it to be sometimes. But we can thank God for it, that it's not like it is in the Boko Haram group of people. Afghanistan's where that being an open Christian, you will get killed. 
You know what? Uh, let me let me just ask you. Uh, some of you, can you tell us what lesson God has taught you through suffering? I, I'm talking about, I'm not suffering for the gospel particularly, but just suffering in self. What lessons has God taught you through suffering? Come on. Well, he didn't taught you anything then, has he? <laughs> I'll tell you, he taught me to, uh, to just cuddle up to Christ, I mean. Amen. It is an opportunity to be in his presence. Amen. It's an opportunity to be in his presence and just cuddle up to Christ. I like that term, Fred. Thank you so much for that. Charlie. I tell you what, I came from a different country, okay? Okay. But when I came in this country, I was suffering. But because of Christ, something had to lead me. Something had to lead me all the way was I was coming because I leave my wife and two kids back home. And for two and a half years, I haven't seen them. But I wait and wait and wait and just get my paper to get through. And then that was suffering. Amen. That was real suffering. And then I came to Texas, but Texas gave me uh, Texas is a great country, believe me. Amen. It is a great country. Now, see, that's experience speaking right there, folks. Charlie came from a different country, and he left in two and a half years. He came here and left his wife and family at home. And, guys, that's suffering there. He knew what was going on with them, but he says now, this is a great country. Thank you, Charlie. We all agree to that, too. So, Ray. All right. All right. It's a basis of faith. Uh, suffering is a basis of faith. Uh, I think that I think that's a that's a good one there also. Yes, Sharon. You know, amen. Sharon was saying that in suffering, God walks with you and pulls you in close and, and just walks with you through the problem. And that's a good thing. It's, it's like what Fred was talking about. You cuddle up with Christ. I mean, that's, that's a neat thought, isn't it? You know, I'll I tell you, uh, an, another type of suffering maybe, uh, I just have to tell you a personal story here. Guy Ford and I, we, we had kind of parallel careers. Now, Guy was smarter than me, and so he became an architect. And I, I'm just a piper. I, I work on those crooked pipes you see in the plants out there. But I'm telling you, there was a time when Guy and I stepped out and started businesses, and, and we were rocking along good, and we were doing good. And then there come a time when, you couldn't find a job in this town if your life depended on it. And times get tough, don't they, guy? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and we understand some of those things. Uh, Betty may have told you, like Glendine told me, you must be nuts. <laughs> but she didn't really say that, but uh, she might have thought it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and it, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. But what it, it, it's taught us to do, uh, after it was all over with, in hindsight, we see this. Hindsight is a good thing, isn't it? Uh, when it was all over with, uh, we say, well, I can see how God was working now. But we, we just, Guy and I didn't know anything else to do. We just get up, dust ourselves off, and, and, and go at it again. And, uh, and then uh, we, after you get up two or three times, you begin to get a little bit smarter. And, and so... <laughs> But anyway, it, it's, it's a suffering that, that we understand that God leads you through for some reason to, to make you stronger in the process. And, and I think he's done that uh, with, with Guy and, and myself because of that. 
we understand more about this life and business and and trying to make a living than we than we ever did before. Paul encourages us to persevere in our faith. Like Grace said, now what does persevere mean? What 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 does it persevere mean to you? Keep on keeping on. Now that's uh, I guess you could say God persevered. We did the guy and I persevered. We didn't know what we were doing, but we was persevering anyway. But we kept on keeping on. And uh, let me let me just show you some real examples of uh, of perseverance in in the, in the, in the world out there. Uh, you, you may know the name uh, Jacob J.K. Rowling, uh, a lady that wrote the books, the Harry Potter series. She was rejected twelve times before she got that first book published by publishers. They didn't think there was anything to it. And now she's literally made several billion dollars by books and movies and everything. Being persistent, persevering. <coughs> Thomas Edison, you all know Thomas Edison, him and his light bulb. He was considered unteachable at an early age. Now, he stated he had found 1,000 ways not to make a light bulb. So it, that, that's his persistence. He was persevering because he knew something would work. Walt Disney, he, his success, too, did not come easily. It says that, that he f was fired from an editing job because he was not creative enough. Henry Ford, many of you know that name. He was one of six living on a farm like most people did in his age, lived on a farm. But he had a mechanical mind. It said at 15 years old, he'd, he invented his first steam engine at 15. Now, he wasn't going to be a farmer, and I don't blame him. I wouldn't be a farmer either, but, but he, he leaves and he goes to Detroit. And he begins to work there, and he is now known as the inventor of the assembly line that revolutionized production in, in factories like that. You know, there's a lot of things in life that require perseverance, guys. And that's you and I in daily walking with God. We have to persevere, guys. In, in life in general, Matthew 10, 22 says, persevere, and the ones that persevere to the end will be saved. Now, you'll have to talk to Ernest about all that means, but, but I'm telling you this, but persevering to the end... Persevering is part of the walk that you and I are in in this life. We have to persevere. It's not always pleasant. I can imagine what the, the people in, in, in those countries are going through to persevere through that when just knowing your, your faith will get you killed. You remember Jared and Jennifer so many times that that just brings to mind when I think about those two kids, how they... Uh, you remember, Jared gets in a pulpit here and he cries because of what was going on in his life over there. But he persevered. And for that, there's no telling how many, maybe millions of people come to know Christ in that area there. You know, I, I guess one of the things, living out our faith is difficult to do. It, it's, it's just not easy to put your faith in something you cannot touch and feel in it. It, it, it's hard to understand why things happen the way they do. Well, maybe we're not supposed to understand why it happens the way it does. And, you, and then you'll have people that doubt your, and question your faith and, and, and your beliefs. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we know what that means. Uh, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Guys, we've been given the ability to share our faith with others. Everyone, we've been given that ability. Now, how do, how do I know that? Simply because all you're telling someone is what Christ has done for you. That's all we can tell people. 
That's all we can know. It's just what Christ has done for us. He said, be strong through the grace of Christ. Now, you know, let me ask you this. Does the believer participate in empowering or does God do the empowering? What did he say? God said, be strong in the grace of God. Be strong in the grace. You remember when Joshua took over from, after Moses, he took over and and the people said, we will do exactly what you say, yet be strong and courageous. So, God, that's what it, Here's this tension, guys, of sovereignty of God and man's free will. We, we talk about that a lot, or I talk about it a lot, because it, it is the sovereignty of God and man's free will. See, both are involved in salvation, and, and in the Christian life also it's involved, because God deals with us in a covenant relationship. And we know, uh, we, we've studied that many times, but in a covenant relationship, there's rights and there's responsibilities. And there is requirements and there's privileges in each co in this covenant responsibility. And see, but grace is always the priority. But a human response is mandated. This grace of God goes out to the world but a human response is required. As Paul was telling Timothy this. He said, Timothy, share what you've learned from me. Now, I don't encourage you to do that with this, Paul, but you learn on your own. But I'm telling you, uh, he said, share. I used to think that when trying to put lessons together and stuff, well, Paul, all you're doing is looking at commentaries and things and reading the Bible and thinking about this stuff. All you're doing is using somebody else's material. Well, so what? I mean, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, and, and that's what Paul is saying. Timothy, use my material because I've told you right. And, and I wish you, when you prepare a lesson, you think about that because it's not plagiarism to me. It, it is learning what some people have learned before you and taken that and trying to, to, to fit it to a lesson here. So, but we understand those things, guys. And here is uh, Paul said, pass on the, these apostolic teachings that I've told you, Timothy. I don't want you to pass on your own personal opinions and, and your own personal ideas about stuff. How many times have you talked to someone about Christ and they come up with something that off the wall, you wonder, where'd you get that? Well, you know, it may not be in the Bible, but it's a good thought. Well, that's not what Paul's saying. Paul, what the, these, these teachings that I've told you, it's not your own personal opinion. I want you to tell me, uh, you share with what I've shared with you. And he says this, in the presence of many witnesses, in that verse there, in what Timothy heard, Paul teach was confirmed by prophets and, and, and the guys ahead of him. And so this is what we're talking about. All the prophets and teachers that, that had come down from Paul had learned from them. He was sharing with them, and they'd been approved by these guys. Now, why do we want to do that? <clears throat> why do we want to share all this? He said, because so that you might learn and share this with others everywhere you go. And that's the principle, guys, of delegation and multiplication. How many times have we studied that? We've looked at that. And you see, Jesus spent his time with a select few people so that they might go and reach many. I have to tell you, uh, another day, most of, I've one of the, I guess, uh, one of the last ones left, I guess, that was, that was part of, of just a small part of bringing Ernest to this church in 1979. And that's a few years ago. <laughs> but when Ernest came here, let me tell you what he did. Uh, it, it, it speaks exactly what Paul is talking about here and, and exactly what Jesus did with the twelve. Ernest, back then we could do things different. You you can't do it now because you've got to you got to get okay from the city and all this stuff to go knock on doors. But Ernest would take one of us. I don't know of a, of a deacon body. I don't remember how many we had then. But um, 
But he would take just one of us at a time and go out and knock on doors. And he didn't say it, but, but what he meant was learn from me. Did exactly what Jesus did. And we did learn from Ernest. We did learn about things like that. And so anyway, it's, it's the same process that, that Paul is saying, just do this. And so I'm, I'm just taking you, Timothy, aside, and I want you to learn from me and then do what I did. And it worked. It, uh, it was uh, Ernest modeled ministry. Not, not too much anymore because of the restrictions you have about moving around Deer Park and getting reported for this and that, knocking on people's door, and they don't like it anymore. And so, but whatever it was, I know uh, Russell and I and uh, several others were, were participated in that a lot. And it was a good thing. It was a good thing because we learned, and um, I was young then, and so. <laughs> But nonetheless, guys, it, it is. A, see, our adequacy does, does not come from one's intelligence. It just doesn't. It, it, our education or your personality type, we must be faithful communicators of, of God's world, word and truth, though. Now, in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And Timothy, endure hardships. Get used to it, God. It's going to happen. Suffer with me like a good soldier. You know, I don't know... Uh, I. I was not. I did not serve in the military, and and if if I had it life to do over, I'd find a way to do it because I I like the military. I like the discipline that they put. Now, but I don't know you guys that uh, that were in the military. I just wonder. Uh, you didn't get to take your your big screen TV with you and and all of those things with you to boot camp, did you, Emmett? Did you do that? <laughs> you see, uh, you don't get to that. You can't, you, you got to leave stuff behind. You got to leave stuff behind. You can't, you're not weighed down. In other words, that's what Paul is telling Timothy. Don't get weighed down with all that stuff. You're going into battle. I want you to learn. He said, and he often described the Christian life in military terms, guys. And, uh, you know, it, it's been said that I've, I was fortunate enough one time to, to go to Normandy in, in France and and stand on that hill and look down on Omaha Beach and <clears throat> and visualize what went on there and and I'm telling you guys if if, if you stood where we are with by some big German bunker up there that the gun's not there but the bunker's still there and look down on that beach and and visualize what happened if, if you don't get emotional over that with those tens of thousands crosses behind you in that cemetery then uh, maybe you need to check the oil a little bit because it is, it is what we see there. Uh, it's been studied for years. What was it in the mind of 18 to 20-year-old kids that when that vessel pulled up and that end dropped down, to jump in that water and take off toward that beach and storm that beach, no one, that they were probably going to get killed. Those guys that finally made it off the beach, climbing the rope to get up onto the hill, knowing they were going to get shot when they got up to the top. But they did it. They just kept on doing it. What was it? And I, don't, I never did find an answer, but they, it's been studied. What was in their mind when they did that? Uh, guys, it's simply you're, you're under the authority of someone, and they told you to do it. Now, I don't know what the world would be like today if that same situation. But I think somehow it might be a little bit different. I'm not sure we'd ever get off the boat. But nonetheless, when you see that, it, it's, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, be like a good soldier on active duty, guys. Whether you're a soldier, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a farmer, do not entangle yourself with, the, with those things that... It's not that secular things are bad, guys. It's just that 
They can't be priority. If we go into the service for Christ, we have to be singularly focused. Now, it's, it's a, just simply said, that those leaders in the military, wherever you are, must maintain a ministry focus. And, and he said, Timothy, you can persevere because God will provide. See, you're, the, you're under the authority of God, Timothy. So go in there like a good soldier and die for Christ. I think is exactly what he was trying to do. See, we have one job in, in this world, and that's to be obedient to Christ. Now, that takes uh, different uh, venues, but it, it is a hard thing to do. In 2 Timothy 2, 5 through 7, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. God, here, Paul told Timothy to be disciplined and honorable. Play by the rules, Timothy. You get into the fight. If you, if you get into a contest, you do, you got to play by the rules or you're going to lose. How many times do we see that in today's world? People are just determined to cheat, aren't they? And no matter what rule you're in. I, I, I guess Paul is telling Timothy, by, by diligently sowing the gospel, you will reap the reward. See, uh, the, the soldiers fight for the commander. Commander says, jump off the hill. They jumped off the hill. Athletes strive to win the crown. I mean, and there's going to be a lot of striving this afternoon. That's all I've seen in three days now about the Super Bowl this afternoon. And one of them will win. I'm pretty sure of that. Now, farmers work hard to partake of their crops. I had a brother that's a farmer in the panhandle. We used to talk about this a lot. And I'd tell him, John, I don't understand farming. Now, you take all these seed, you go out there and plant it in that field, and then you wait. And you wait. And you wait, and the seed germinates and begins to stick through the soil, if it's, the seed was good. And then you get one of these sandstorms that cuts it off at the ground. And then if your sandstorm don't get it, it gets up about a foot tall, hail comes and beats it into the ground. And I said, I can't do that. I mean, that's not my life. But you know what? My brother would tell me, you plant the seed, then you wait. And in due time, you will harvest the crop. Think about that when you're planting those seeds of Christ in someone's life. It may not happen then. It may not happen for 10 years. But it's planted. One day it will germinate. It will do it. All of this involves commitment, effort, patience, suffering. But all receive their reward in due time. That's and then Paul says something interesting here. He says, consider what I say. Now, now why, why did Paul say this? Consider what I say. He, he, I, I think probably what it is, he's talking about again. He wants you to meditate on something. He don't want you just to read it and keep moving. Read it, go back and read it again. And think about it. Think about it. You know, I don't know what. I, I never was a farmer, but I know something about a cow. A cow has one stomach, but inside this stomach is f at least four compartments. Four little stomachs inside the one stomach. And you realize what this old cow does? She eats and then lays down. And she's chewing this cud. And you see what's happening inside that stomach? She's regurgitating the food chewing more nutrients out of it and continues on until it works through those four stomachs. And that's what Paul is telling us to do. Meditate on that. Chew on my word. Do what I'm saying. Read it. Meditate. Think about it. Joshua 1, chapter 8. 
I mean, chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. God, it doesn't get any clearer than that. Meditate on God's word, and then we'll see coming to fruition. We will see the, the bringing uh, the soil to where that you can use the food. Let me just close this, this time right now with uh, Bill Hybels. I, I know he's had a, a blowout, but, uh, but he wrote a book, Just Walk Across the Room. And in this book, he says, Someday, friends, there comes a harvest. Someday, sinners become saints. And between now and then, we get to keep spreading the message. We get to keep playing the roles we were meant to play. We get to keep planting seeds, trusting that God will bring the increase. Because in due time, oh, the increase he brings. Thank you for being here this morning. Paul says a ton, and let's just adhere to some of it as we go through this life and do those things. Lord, we are grateful, God, for you this morning. And, Lord, we need to do exactly what Paul's telling Timothy to do. We see such a transformation in Paul's life. And I guess we want to be like him. We want that transformation to happen in our lives. But... But God had a special purpose for Paul. And, he, of course, he's got a special purpose for you, me and, and the rest in this room. But, Lord, we know that, that young Timothy was going out on his own. Young Timothy lived to be some 80 years old. And he died in Ephesus because of the testimony to the people that didn't want to hear the testimony. And, Lord, may we somehow continue to plant seeds in this life as long as you let us. And in due time, the seed will sprout. Lord, we thank you for that promise in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, folks. Yes. Well, thank you, Sonny. This week, I read something in a history book that I've always thought that was true. That when they were coming in on those boats, coming in on Omaha Beach, the sergeants told them that only very few of them would live to get off of the beach. 